I'm glad many of you were able to make it. I, our attendance is down a bit this evening, and I wonder if that's because we have friends and neighbors and colleagues who are without power right now. Um, I was just thinking how wonderful it is to have Zoom, that we can stay snug and cozy in our own homes. We don't have to get in the car and drive to a central meeting point. In fact, we can sit with our cup of tea or glass of wine and enjoy the meeting in the security of our own homes. And then I find out that our speaker tonight had to drive down to Corvallis. He's from the Monmouth area and he is running on a generator and cooking with propane and has no internet. So he's driven down to Corvallis tonight to join us. Um, our speaker tonight is Neil Bell, who is uh, the uh, community horticulture agent uh, for the Extension Service in Marion and Polk counties, just to our north. Since 2000, he has uh, overseen the Master Gardener programs in both counties, and he also helps to coordinate the Northwest Plant Evaluation uh, Program. It's a research program that evaluates plants for unirrigated landscapes in the Willamette Valley. And I know a lot of the experiments he does is actually in his own property. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see a number of slides of that tonight. Um, so he's going to talk about reasons why you should consider developing a landscape which is not irrigated during our summer dry climate uh, here in the Willamette Valley. Um, he'll discuss how to assess your landscape for any issues that you may need to consider to address to meet this goal. And he'll also describe a number of woody and herbaceous plants which will provide year round interest in this no or low water garden situation. Um, the uh, Neil is very interested in ornamental plants. So of course he wants to look at things that will give some beauty at any time of the year. So Neil, welcome. We're looking very much forward to your talk. And thank you for joining us tonight at uh, with the extra drive that you had to take. Thanks, Alan. No problem. Uh, my pleasure. Um, it was actually nice to get out of the house for a change and not have to clean up down limbs and so on for a for a, for a nice day. And so it was a it's a it's a pleasure to be here. So um, shall I share my screen and get started then? Yep. Go ahead. It's all yours, Neil. Okay. All right. And oh, one one quick note. Uh, we can uh, do most of the questions at the end of the program, but if something is a hot question during the program, uh, enter it into the chat. And uh, Deb Kern and I will be monitoring the chat, and uh, we'll uh, if it looks like it makes sense to interrupt Neil, you know, right at the moment, then uh, we'll do that. Sounds now good. All right. Well. Uh, can everyone see this now? Yes. I hope so. We were commenting on uh, the uh, the user friendliness of Zoom earlier on. So, um, well, uh, what I will uh, have for you today is a presentation on designing a, a landscape, an ornamental landscape. Of course, there's a whole another um, aspect to designing a food producing landscape without water. But what we're gonna to talk today about is uh, landscaping with ornamentals without the use of uh, an irrigation system. So uh, what uh, the program will cover, and, and Alan touched on this, is why even develop a landscape without irrigation when irrigation might be a, uh, available to you? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the climate in Western Oregon um, if you choose to go down this road, uh, then uh, evaluating your site for any challenges. Um, and then plant selection for year round interest. So that's the fluff section at the end. Um, and there's a plant list associated with this, which I forwarded to Alan. So I, I, I assume that can be made available on the website. Um, so it has some resources um, as well as the list of plants that I'll, we'll talk about. So you, you don't need to <laughs> be writing down names. Um, yeah, so I, I took this little article out of our local paper in Polk County, the Itemizer Observer, a few years ago, where the um, the article was about you know potential limitations on the supply of water in Polk County, which you know when you think about it is a, a concerning thing. Uh, we we think of water as being freely available, but 
Um, of course, for many uh, gardeners, uh, particularly in rural areas, that's not the case, especially if they are like we are, or at least were, uh, when we originally moved to our property 25 years ago, on a well, which was limited in its, um, in its uh, output. So when we talk about landscaping without water, this person is landscaping evidently without the use of water, but we can do oh so much better than this. So this is not the type of thing that I'm describing. Um, so what I am going to talk about though is developing a landscape exclusively with the use of whatever water happens to fall from the sky, which is uh, remarkably easy to do. Um, and I'm sure some of you can give examples of that. So here is a portion of our garden, um, which at first sight contains plants which you wouldn't automatically think of when you think of drought tolerant plants, including the roses, which I'll get to later on. Um, but yeah, I mean, we uh, probably have more of a problem. Um, well, we, because I'm partly responsible for this, uh, a problem, problem with overgrowth rather than undergrowth on our landscape. Um, so it's uh, surprisingly easy to develop a landscape without an irrigation at all and, and end up with a pruning problem on your hands as well. So vigor is not a problem. Um, so why develop a landscape without the use of, of, of summer irrigation? For one is, as I was saying earlier, you might not have the water to be able to do that. And that certainly was the case uh, when we moved originally to our property and had only the well, we subsequently hooked up to the water co-op in the area, Lucky, Lucky Mute as it's called, um, but still we don't irrigate most of our landscape. You can save on the cost of water, which I know uh, some urban residents with large gardens uh, pay a substantial bill for uh, water, especially of course in the summertime when you're adding on that irrigation into the, into the garden. You will also save on the cost of an irrigation system um, you just like to use drought tolerant plants, uh, which have their own unique characteristics in uh, many cases, including um, being aromatic in some cases. And I put here, you can reduce your summer weed problems. What I should say is like when you alter any cultural practice, um, you end up with a weed shift. So the weeds that will, you know, be able to tolerate a summer dry garden will not be the same weeds that would be prevalent in a irrigated landscape. But the good news is that many of the weeds which are drought tolerant are also rather diminutive compared to the ones that need summer irrigation. So they're easier to manage or easier to ignore, I guess. So here's our garden. This is the, another side. This is the house, obviously. It was built in 1996. Um, and so when we moved to the property, this is on Ferns Corner Road, south of Dallas and, and west of Monmouth. So it's in the foothills of the coast range. And like a lot of those areas, it doesn't have a lot of water to begin with. Uh, so the well was essentially it's sufficient for the house, um, but not really enough to do any serious irrigation uh, of, the, of the garden. And any irrigation that we did do was uh, used for the vegetable garden, um, more so than all of these ornamentals. So by uh, sheer necessity, I guess you could say, um, our landscape evolved to be a collection of those things which perform well without needing any summer irrigation at all. So here's another section of the, the of uh, this is on the south facing. It switched up a little bit from this. Um, I don't recommend planting these big uh, Fremontodendrons, that's that yellow flowering thing, anywhere near your house because it's just a big messy thing. But it's spectacular when it's in bloom. But again, no, no irrigation on this, on this, um, uh, on this, for the most part, uh, in our garden at all. Um, and then the other, uh, I, I don't know which interest drove which, uh, uh, but Alan mentioned we have this research program. Uh, Heather Stoven and I, my colleague in um, Yamhill County, where we evaluate cultivars of landscape plants under unirrigated conditions. So we're, we're measuring growth, we're measuring flowering, we're measuring cold hardiness, um, as well as any disease or insect pest issues that arise. And so this shows one of those evaluations, which was up in uh, the, the Oregon Garden, uh, which is an evaluation of Ceanothus. So we call this evaluation program Northwest Plant Evaluations. And every few years we start a new trial. This was one um, of rock roses. Uh, and this one, it was actually at the North Willamette Research and Extension Center, which is where our current research is being done. Um, so this is the cystus evaluation we had from 2004 to 2009. And more recently, we had an evaluation of manzanitas, which will come into the discussion later on when we talk about plants. So that is now gone. And we've now moved to an evaluation of broadleafed evergreen ground covers. 
uh, which was planted in 2019. So uh, this just shows a nice ground cover of uh, Mahonia, which I took a picture of a few years ago. So um, that's sort of the background, if you like. And so by personal experience and also by research, um, our knowledge of what to plant and how successful it will be long term has grown accordingly. So um, I just thought I'd put this graphic up here. Um, this shows a little map of the Mediterranean climate areas of the world. So uh, as what's kind of interesting about these and the Mediterranean climate is one in which the uh, summers are warm and dry, the winters are mild and wet. So this book was put out by somebody you just know it was somebody in California because the Mediterranean climate zones here end at the Oregon border um, or sometimes they include the Rogue Valley, right? Um, but what's interesting about Mediterranean climate areas of the world is that they occur between you know 30 and I'm gonna say 49 degrees um, on the west facing sides of continents um, in, in both the North and the Southern hemisphere. And that's um, the result of the way that ocean currents uh, move in each um, of those hemispheres. And in the north, in California, Oregon, the uh, ocean currents bring cool water down from the north. Anyway, bottom line is you end up with this very characteristic type of climate where there is very little in the way of summer, uh, summer water or summer rainfall, um, and the winters tend to be somewhat mild uh, in those areas. So that's the defining characteristic, if you like, of a Mediterranean climate. And we can be thought of as sort of a pseudo-Mediterranean climate. This is at... Um, the um, Rancho uh, Santa Ana Botanic Garden in Claremont, California. And clearly that is the heart and soul of a Mediterranean climate. And it's a lovely garden, by the way, if you ever get a chance to visit. Uh, this is the back part of the garden, which looks like native bush. Uh, and you can kind of cast your uh, mind back 200 years, if you like, and pretend that you're in old, old California. Um, so we are not a true, if you like, uh, classical Mediterranean climate. But this is the pattern. Uh, this is actually data for Salem, but as you can see, um, the precipitation is on the blue line and it declines uh, steeply uh, from right, oops, sorry, from now uh, where we're enjoying quite a bit of <laughs> quite a bit of some uh, quite a bit of irrigation uh, to almost nothing during the summer months, and then uh, of course the temperatures gradually rise and become quite warm during the summers and cooling off in the winter. So this is a, a very classic pattern for a Mediterranean climate with that steep um, decline in uh, uh, rainfall during the summer months. And in fact, a deficit, if you like, um, during the summer months uh, when it's uh, much warmer. And so evaporation uh, exceeds rainfall. So this is of course uh, taken up on uh, Chip Ross Park, the, uh, the oaks looking out over the Willamette Valley. And so here in the Willamette Valley, we have kind of like, uh, I guess you could say a modified Mediterranean climate or a temperate Mediterranean climate where it's um, not quite, uh, the drought period is not as long as it would be in a classical Mediterranean climate, but long enough by far to uh, cause stress on plants that aren't adapted to that. And then for the most part, we have pretty mild winters last weekend being an exception. Um, so what you'll find of course, is that tolerance of summer drought will vary amongst landscape plants. Um, I took this photo a few years ago um, in Dallas and whoever had built the home and landscape had event, apparently abandoned the property. Um, and it's pretty apparent that some of them are showing significant amounts of stress, including this cedar or whatever it is over here and these plants here, whereas others seem to be tolerating things a little bit better. Maybe they're better established or whatever. But um, if, if you're looking at a, a, a general sort of look at the, type of landscape plants that are available for sale, the tolerance for uh, prolonged summer drought will vary greatly amongst those plants. So here's just one example up by the hospital in Corvallis. Um, this is Kinnikinnik. Uh, this is Ceanothus gloriosus. This is a Chinese holly, I believe. And down here is some um, winged euonymus. And the color on the winged euonymus and on the um, on the Kinnikinnik is, this picture was taken in August, by the way, um, is very, it makes it very obvious that these are under considerable amount of drought stress because this is an unirrigated planting. Whereas your Ceanothus is unaffected 
um, in any way at all by the drought or lack of water. So it doesn't, you, you don't have to look hard to find examples like this um, just as you travel around. So one of the things that we need to consider is some plants are well adapted to these types of landscapes without water, some are not. Here's another example. This is along, um, oh, Walnut Boulevard, I think, or Circle, Circle? Um, no, that's Walnut Boulevard. This is Arborvita, or was. This is Cherry Laurel. And I took this photo in the winter a couple of years ago. These are now gone, all these, um, all these Arborvita. And so um, increasingly uh, what I've observed here is that the, as, the, as the summers have gotten longer and longer and warmer and warmer, and they have, especially since 2015, um, plants which I never observed drought stress on have started to exhibit it. And Arborvita is one of those plants. So they are from the East Coast. They want that, um, they want that summer irrigation, or I should say summer rainfall, which is what they're accustomed to being from that area. Cherry laurel on the other hand, being from Southern Europe, summer drought is no problem. So yeah, you see things like this where uh, clearly this rhododendron is just being baked to death in this little planting. This is in Salem. And uh, plants like this, of course, are, are uh, exhibiting uh, those symptoms because they're just not well suited um, to, uh, to a summer dry, unirrigated uh, type of environment. The other thing though that we have to deal with here, um, and again, uh, last, last weekend uh, made that painfully obvious, is we get colder than a classical Mediterranean climate. And so not only do we have to have plants which are to able uh, to tolerate the summer drought, they also have to be cold hardy enough to be grown in a landscape long term. So exhibit A of those plants which isn't well suited is this little grevillea, which we had in our grevillea trial a few years ago. Um, this is grevillea linigera coastal gem, which I love because it started to bloom in December. Like so many of these uh, Mediterranean type plants, uh, winter bloom is a, is a common characteristic. So this was the uh, grevillea in December. And this was the same plant about a month and a half later after it got too cold. So, so much for my grevillea linigera. I will say, however, that sometimes these things make great potted plant specimens, but immediately, as, as soon as you put something in a pot, you deprive it of its ability to grow its roots. So they, by definition, become undrought tolerant, if you like. But I grew this in a pot for a few years um, and enjoyed the winter bloom. So there are things one can do. So that's what we deal with. We have a relatively long, uh, warm summer period, which will stress landscape plants that are not adapted to that. And we also have to contend with these occasional cold snaps, which limit the range of things that we can grow to those that are hardy enough to grow around here. So, um, so considering that, what are, what are the site factors that you need to take into consideration? First is, do you have full sun or do you have some shade? So this is a full sun planting uh, in Salem and literally everything in this landscape is, is showing stress, the cedars, this Catoni aster and these little dogwoods over here are in uh, one state or another of um, drought stress. And again, this is a photo taken in an unirrigated landscape in sometime in the summertime. So um, full sun is just a brutal environment if you're not irrigating. Um, sometimes if you've got a little bit of afternoon shade at your disposal, then it actually expands the range of things that you can grow. So um, even if it's a sun loving plant, if it's provided with some shade in the afternoon and it's still getting sufficient sunlight to grow and flower normally, that can prove to be a way of um, increasing the range of things that you can grow without irrigation. One thing I will point out, however, is if, if the shade is being provided by something like this, then this is a very water guzzling uh, plant. And so anything planted in the root zone near that will be contending with the, um, with the, the root system of the fir or other large plant. And it's really common actually to see the effect of that in landscapes where the plants closest to the larger, larger tree or whatever it is um, are more stressed than ones farther away. So large plants like this are significant competition for moisture. Shade from a building, on the other hand, is, of course, benign in that respect. The site aspect, of course, will matter. Uh, so south and west facing slopes are going to be hotter than a north or east facing slope. 
are there any heat radiating structures nearby? I regret to say this is the high school, one of the high schools in Corvallis. And for whatever reason, they planted vine maple on the west side of the um, landscape along with these rhododendrons. And they're slowly being cooked by that large brick wall. So that will pro prove to be a, a source of stress as well, particularly if you're not irrigating. It just adds to the heat load being dealt with by the plants. And then there's soil quality which is so critical, especially in newer homes, um, the soil quality can be quite a challenge. Um, and so it might be a good idea if you're starting out with a new landscape to get a soil test done. They're generally pretty cheap, um, 25 bucks to get uh, the organic matter, the pH, the major nutrients and so forth, which is a big help when you're starting out with a new landscape. And it's generally new landscapes where um, we deal with these soil type problems just because of the nature of construction, which upends the uh, soil structure altogether. And probably the worst part about it is compaction. Um, so that's a really, that's an insidious um, problem for a lot of newer homes um, where uh, the soil quality may be okay, but it's, it's just crushed by the, um, the nature of construction. So those are things which you will want to address before um, landscaping. So here's just another example. And you can just almost look at that landscape and realize that it's been walked on, driven on, uh, materials piled on it. And the result is just a really, really compacted soil, which will prove problematic for plants that like reasonable drainage. So one can hide a lot of ills by planting a lawn. And I will point out that lawns will grow on things that a lot of other landscape plants will not. Grass is a very forgiving type of, uh, type of uh, landscape. Here's an example of what it sometimes comes down to. This is a little landscape that we did in Monmouth in Madrona Park a few years ago. And this RV over here, the, the homeowner that lived there was in the habit of parking his RV on this spot. And so the soil was so rock hard that it was necessary to get this. I did not advocate for this. I suggested they get a backhoe and work the whole thing up but they didn't want to do that. So they got this two person auger to dig the holes for the plants. When it comes down to this, you have a problem. So the easiest and best thing to do would be to work the whole thing up rather than drill these little holes into this concrete, but that's what they chose to do. And that was the finished product. Um, if you've got one of these lying around on the other hand, that makes your job a whole lot easier. This was actually at my old kid's school in Bridgeport on the Kings Valley highway. And we, worked in some organic matter with this um, large piece of equipment because the soil was compact and we had a lot of organic matter. So it ended up with a very nice fluffy result. But a shovel works well too. And so this was part of our landscape way back in the day where I was digging in some organic matter. So it can be done um, either way. Um, I prefer to do that and I would advocate for that before I suggested adding soil. Now you can buy stuff that's called topsoil um, a lot of the topsoil that's sold in the Willamette Valley is actually sand. You know, texturally it's sand or maybe loamy sand, depending on the load that you get. But texturally it's very different from the uh, clay type soils that are characteristic of most areas of the Willamette Valley. So by just dropping this on top of the post-construction soil, you create problems of your own. So this was that, this is that very house. And then later on, this is the, um, the landscape that they created. Notice the lawn is highly chlorotic because they planted it on sand. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind is maybe one characteristic um, that's not necessarily desirable is it's not a very good source of nutrients. So I, like I said, to me, it's just better to um, work with the soil on site rather than bring something in. This is another problem you'll sometimes run into is that that material is mined from near the Willamette River and as such um, it often comes along with a healthy dose of horsetail which is the weed growing in between these rows which is not fun to have to deal with. So again by bringing soil in you end up with problems you would not otherwise have had. And here's one more thing. When you put a porous medium on top of a compacted medium, you create kind of a perched water table. And here's an example of this. This is a lawn in South Salem, which had other issues. It was partly shaded too. But look how thin the lawn is and how wet that site looks. And when we took a core here, what we found was at the bottom, there's the native soil 
on which this sand has been dropped, as well as uh, looks as though they added maybe a third layer of this sort of um, a, a garden blend, as it's sometimes called, which is a mix of organic matter and that sandy material. And look at how wet it is here. It's just sopping wet because that water or that rainfall will move into that sandy layer, encounter that compacted layer of clay below, and really have nowhere to go. So you end up with a sort of a wet uh, environment and not a lot of plants are happy growing in perpetually wet feet in the wintertime. So just saying, better to work with and work uh, organic material into the soil that you already have. The other thing which goes along with this is any inherent drainage problems. Um, and there's very few landscape plants which are gonna be happy sitting in a situation like this. And I regret to say this is outside the Valley Library on campus. And I don't know how much this planting still survives, but clearly everything is suffering. Um, and you can see by the standing water, they have a significant drainage problem. So any drainage problems should be, uh, should be cleared up before planting occurs. Okay, how am I doing for time? Oh, I think I'm doing pretty well. So the, um, those are just things to keep in mind. Um, I think the soil related things are very important um, and creating a reasonably drained environment um, is just, is good for any landscape plant, but also for um, the, the plants that we'll be, we'll be talking about. So I guess I should give, based on that, my definition of a drought tolerant plant, which is a plant which after a short establishment period will grow and flower normally without supplemental irrigation. Um, by short establishment period, I would say it's ideal to plant in the fall, in September, October, and then, you know, you need to water them a little bit in, at that time of the year before the uh, winter rains take over. But the advantage of doing so is that by the following year, um, and the following droughts period in the summer, the plant is typically well established enough to not need any further summer irrigation. And of course, that will depend on what it is and um, also the environment in which it happens to be growing. Uh, and then notice it says we'll grow and flower normally. That doesn't mean that it won't show stress. Uh, as we'll see, um, some of the plants that I'll describe do show very obvious stress. Uh, and that happens to be their mechanism, if you like, of dealing with prolonged summer drought. So uh, drought tolerant plants don't necessarily not show stress due to drought, um, drought problems, but you still get the ornamental characteristics that you were looking for. Um, and they're not impeded by prolonged summer, prolonged summer drought. So there's a number of plants which wouldn't fit that category. Um, many common annual plants, uh, other than native annuals, of course, many of which go summer dormant. Uh, most, not all, ornamental grasses and other perennials like daylilies and redbeckia and asters and so forth, which are sometimes, you know, lumped in with drought tolerant plants, but that hasn't been, hasn't been my observation, especially in the Willamette Valley. And then um, rhododendrons, sometimes you will see, and I think it's worth mentioning that as some of these plants become better established, then you'll find exceptions to all of the, the, the examples I'm given here. But in general, right from the get-go, uh, things like rhododendron, things like viburnum david eye, things like some many kinnikinnic um, cultivars, uh, which are commonly grown around here, really aren't particularly tolerant of drought. And I will show gory examples to prove what I mean. And then another one you sometimes see as being uh, bandied around as being drought tolerant is heavenly bamboo, but I just have not seen good performance um, of those. And way back in the day, we did an evaluation of heaties as well. That's actually what got us started in the plant evaluation business. And, you know, there's some, again, that would be kind of sort of drought tolerant. I grow one in particular without summer irrigation, but it's also been in the ground for 15 years. Um, and most of them would not fit that um, would not fit that definition and do require some summer irrigation. And really, it's just a matter of considering where did they originate? Where what what is their native environment? Where were they uh, native to? And what was the climate in that area? And that'll tell you a lot about potential um, tolerance of drought. Not always, but in a lot of cases it will. Turf is another thing which is worth mentioning uh, because of course many of us have turf in our landscapes. This is a part of our landscape and this is a number of years ago. Um, we, uh, again, we didn't have water. We didn't um, uh, wa have water for the shrubbery, never mind uh, the lawn. So the lawn tended to not be irrigated at all. It would go completely dormant as such. And so this was in the summertime. And then in the fall, 
um, for many years, it would just green up when it started to rain again and all was well. Well, that's no longer really the case. And what we found is, especially in the last five years or so, um, parts, of the land, uh, parts of the lawn start to die. So what I've taken to doing, since I don't want to reseed and all the hassle that goes along with that, is just throwing a sprinkler on the thing once every 10 days or so and giving it a soaking. And that has proven to keep the crowns of the, plant, of the lawn alive um, rather than dying outright. So I would say there, you know, a, a lawn, in my opinion, won't survive in the Willamette Valley without some stress, um, unless it's given some summer water. Um, you can definitely reduce the amount of water you give a lawn as long as you're prepared to see it gradually turn a crispy shade of brown. So for croquet, not so good, but it still can be walked on. All right, so that was the preamble. So let's talk a little bit about plant selection for year-round interest. So what this is, a, as I mentioned earlier on, is a, um, is a chronological list of plants that could be grown without summer irrigation, starting in January and going through December. So there's something for every um, month of the year. So of course, native plants are a, a natural thing to consider when we're talking about that because was, the native plants um, are um, adapted to summer drought. So we'll talk about shrubs and bulbs and perennials for the most part. I will avoid discussing things like cactus, uh, which you can find growing and flowering in landscapes in the Lamb Valley. This was a picture I took, oh, I can't remember where, but it's somewhere in the valley. Um, and here's another example um, of uh, cactus growing in a uh, garden in up near Canby. Um, you know, those are uh, interesting uh, plants for landscapes, but I thought I'd stick to more bread, <laughs> bread and butter type things, but it can be done. There are some cactuses which are cold hardy and tolerant of our wet winters to, to grow here. And the other thing, not to diss conifers or anything, uh, but uh, we could go into a discussion of um, how, uh, which conifers are most tolerant of drought as well. I've, I've, I've avoided those just because I'm going to stick to broadleaf plants um, for this discussion, but there are many examples of plants which uh, are coniferous that could be grown without irrigation at all in the Willamette Valley as well. I didn't want anyone to think that I was just ignoring those. Um, when you are considering natives, uh, consider origin like everything else. Uh, there are some native plants which uh, occur in wetter environments than others. So here's an example, which is thimbleberry growing in this really, really damp area. Mm, I think that might be in the gorge somewhere. Um, but clearly thimbleberry is, is not a drought tolerant plant and would let you know uh, where you're choosing to uh, avoid irrigating it in the, um, in the summertime. On the other hand, there's things like ocean spray, and this is up, I believe, this is up on Chip Ross Park as well, um, which are clearly well adapted to growing in uh, full sun or partial shade without any water at all, because that's where it naturally occurs. So that's something to bear in mind when you're considering um, native plants. And then um, there isn't time to consider all of the various native uh, perennials and, and annuals, which would be extremely well suited to an unirrigated landscape simply because that's again, the environment in which they naturally occur. This is a checker mallow, which grows right along the roadside on Ferns Corner Road, uh, where we live um, west of Monmouth. Very pretty in the summertime. So without further ado, let's start in January. Um, this is uh, a native plant, not native to the Willamette Valley, but native to the coast and farther south. Uh, this is Garia elliptica, um, which is a large evergreen shrub. If you're gonna plant this thing, give it lots of space and give it full sun. Uh, it will flower much better as most of these native plants do in full sun. Some native plants will tolerate some shade, but what you'll see is a diminishment, if you like, of the uh, amount of flowering that they do. But silk tassel has these chains of flowers which dangle down and it's really a textural thing. I mean I, I don't think I've really observed a lot of insect activity on these. Uh, this probably because they're wind pollinated um, and I don't detect any fragrance but it's a large uh, evergreen shrub which has this great textural look when it's in bloom. So it's tough but it needs a lot of space. This is a northern California relative of our flowering current which um, as you know, flowering current will begin flowering in March and then into April. Chaparral current, Ribes malvaceum, is uh, found in Northern California. There's a number of select forms out there and it begins blooming typically after Thanksgiving and will continue through the end of March. It's got this incredibly long bloom period um, 
uh, throughout the whole winter. Uh, this is growing against the background of these Douglas firs on our property. It does not get any summer irrigation at all. Um, it's quite aromatic as well. It's got that sort of chaparral smell. And of course, at this time of the year, if you've got overwintering hummingbirds, they can't get enough of this plant. It seems impervious to cold, as far as I can tell, it's been there so long and we've had so many cold snaps, um, that um, it will continue to bloom uh, all winter long. And in addition to the hummingbirds, uh, if it gets warm enough during the wintertime, you'll also see pollinators visiting these flowers as well. One characteristic of this thing that get, takes getting used to is that like some other Mediterranean, true Mediterranean plants, or like for that matter, some of our native plants, uh, it will go partly to fully summer deciduous. So you, you have to get used to that. The deciduous period of time is in summer. And then when it starts to rain in the fall, then it starts to leaf out again and again, it'll start to bloom usually um, shortly after Thanksgiving. Probably the longest blooming plant that we have grown in our garden. Snowdrops, of course, um, those are in bloom now. They seem a little slower to bloom this year, in my opinion, than they've done in the past. Generally, it's sort of a January thing, but they're at their best right now. Um, and then hazelnut, of course, if you drive around the valley now, there's, there's thousands and thousands of more acres of uh, hazelnut in uh, in orchards, but there's also, of course, various ornamental forms of hazelnut. This one is the old form of Coralus avalana called contorta, which has those twisted uh, branches, which is unfortunately sensitive to eastern filbert blight. But I put this in here because you still see these in landscapes, and this is the effect that you get in the dead of winter. So again, these chains of these or catkins of, of flowers and those contorted stems. There's also newer ones, including uh, a couple of new red foliaged and red catkin forms of ornamental um, core, uh, uh, hazelnut from OSU, uh, including burgundy lace, which is one of them. But here's another one. This is one called red majestic with those red uh, catkins as opposed to the yellow one. So that's quite a different effect. Neat plants. Um, and then there's a, uh, a uh, a, a single winter flowering species of Clematis. This is Clematis cirrhosa. Uh, there's a number of select forms of this. This is growing on a, a little trellis, which is totally inadequate for it in our garden. And you see it's starting to take over the, oops, sorry, the uh, plant next door. So it's growing into that. And, and so far they're coexisting, so I'm letting it go. But yeah, this is a, a, a Mediterranean form of clematis, which is winter flowering, like as many Mediterranean plants are. So that was a photo I took of it, I think it was last week before all this ice mayhem started. And if you're looking to get an idea of how many of these things there are, this is the um, Rogerson clematis collection up in Lake Oswego. And so they grow these, um, these uh, forms of clematis cirrhosa on uh, these little trellises. So this is one called uh, cirrhosa variety purpurea freckles. And so you got the name freckles from the little spots in the flower. So there's a number of select forms of these vining clematis out there. So they're very pretty when in bloom. Bulbs, of course, so this is Iris histrioides, um, one of the reticulated type of irises which bloom right in the wintertime. I've taken pictures of these with a little dusting of snow on them. So they're true winter bloomers, really good. And it's not, it's, Iris histrioides is not the only winter blooming um, form of iris. Again, this is like a annotated list of things that one can grow through the year without irrigation. Sweet box, um, probably one of the most commonly grown along with, um, along with heaths uh, of the winter blooming plant. So you'll see this used as a tall ground cover in shady areas and that's where it seems to be um, most commonly used, it's really not very tolerant of full sun. So if you're going to use this, this is the uh, nice characteristic of being very tolerant, in fact, preferring full shade and still blooming um, very heavily. And of course, it's called sweet box because it's very fragrant. Very trimmable plants. Um, there's two major forms, although there's other species out there, Sarcococa confusa and Hookeriana, which are variations on a theme, you might say. Uh, this is confusa with the shorter, wider leaves and uh, the white flowers. Uh, this is Hookeriana, which has, I think, a little bit more textural appeal because the leaves are longer and narrower, um, but also has those small, white, fragrant flowers, in this case with purple anthers. So, um, you know, you get uh, about a month's worth of bloom out of these things, and the scent is, is wonderful and can be detected from 
a considerable distance away, particularly on warmer winter days. Amongst the perennials, uh, the hardy, the hardy, uh, the more drought tolerant of the hellebores, I would say that as opposed to hellebores hybridus is Corsican hellebore, hellebores argutifolius, but again, you get those greenish flowers. Uh, and the beauty of having hellebores is once you have one hellebore, it won't be long before you have many, many more hellebores because they seed themselves with wild abandon, politely uh, amongst, um, around the, the mother plant, if you like. Um, so you'll end up with a lot of seedlings from these things, um, which are more or less indistinguishable from one another. But nice plant, it's evergreen, so it uh, doesn't disappear on you during the winter months. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we did an evaluation of manzanitas, and we could, we could have an entire presentation on manzanitas uh, because of the sheer geographic uh, diversity and diversity of form and function, if you like, that manzanita offers. But um, basically, of, of the manzanitas, which are sort of a Western North American uh, genus of shrubs of all shapes and sizes, uh, the best known of which, of course, is kinnikinnik, which is Arctostaphylos uva ursi. It also has the distinction, um, because of the forms that one finds in cultivation, of being one of the least drought tolerant um, of the manzanitas. This is a planting of what is probably Arctostaphylos uva ursi Massachusetts, which is a form um, grown from seed collected in Massachusetts. So it's a very widely distributed species. But the forms that we grow are uh, like Massachusetts, not from this area. So uh, if you're going to grow kinnikinnik um, in a garden without irrigation, I would suggest the use of some native form, um, which is uh, found from the West Coast, where of course we deal with summer drought because it doesn't, you don't have to go far to find examples of kinnikinnik growing, um, this is at the beach um, on the coast, uh, in unirrigated situations. I mean, in sand, not, 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 nonetheless. So um, if we're going to use kinnikinnik specifically in a drought tolerant landscape, I would choose a form which uh, was from the West Coast, or maybe they're even allowed to take some cuttings off this one because it was a pretty good form that was fruiting heavily. But manzanitas are found all over the West. Uh, this is a crater lake. Um, so it's a large genus, uh, varying greatly in form. And this is probably greenleaf manzanita, uh, Arctostaphylos patula, which is all over the, uh, all over central Oregon. The larger forms, of course, are uh, sculptural uh, because of the uh, branching and especially the bark. So uh, these become architectural specimens as well as good flowering shrubs for the garden. And then in some cases, there's other ornamental appealing things like uh, in this case, this one called uh, Canyon Blush has this nice reddish new growth. So sometimes they'll feature that as well. And then the flowers come in a, um, a either the white form or uh, pinky red forms, depending on the cultivar or species involved. So the flowers are that classic um, Heath family little bell uh, dangling from these clusters. Bloom period will depend on the one you choose, but generally speaking, it will be from uh, December through uh, middle of April or so. Um, and then as you'll see, hummingbirds just can't get enough of these things, but also other pollinators too. If it gets warm enough in January and February, out will come the pollinators to, to visit. So not only the honeybee that you see there, but also native pollinators as well. And the name manzanita comes from the resemblance of the uh, fruit of the manzanita to a little apple. So manzanita meaning little apple. So of course, high on the list would be considering native forms. Uh, this is Arctostaphylos columbiana, hairy manzanita, which you can find in the coast range and also in the Cascades. Um, it's reputed to be a little bit hard to propagate from cuttings, but it's a nice bluish green shrub with white flowers. So obviously a native one would be high on the list. In our trial, we had about 75 different um, cultivars of manzanita. This is just a small selection of some of those ranging in size, which did well. This is Arctostaphylos nomularia. This is one called select form, which is a diminutive shrub that grew to about, I don't know, about two and a half feet tall and four feet across. Um, and so had this nice shiny foliage and great tight habit, which was uh, really an appealing little small scale ground cover. 
For covering larger areas of ground, this is Arctostaphylos hookeri, a select form called wayside. There's a number of Arctostaphylos hookeri. They're from central part of California. They prove to be pretty tough, maybe a little bit of tip damage in really cold winters like 2013 or 2016, but generally speaking, completely hardy for the landscape here and much taller and wider spreading. So you don't need a lot of these to cover a lot of space. And this plant is probably, when the photo was taken, only about, I don't know, six or so years old. So once they get going, they're pretty fast growing. Um, this is a larger one, Arctostaphylos sentinel, but it was one of the truly winter flowering ones. So this, will, this one will bloom in January and into, into February. A big rounded shrub, about eight feet by eight feet. So again, it needs space, but a heavy bloomer with these pink flowers. And again, the hummingbirds will state their claim to this thing um, uh, during the winter time. And uh, here's one that was growing in our garden. Um, it's uh, Austin Griffiths, another pink flowering. Uh, tree-like form, if you like, so a taller one, uh, which shows off its bark very well. But again, the flowering period is January and early February. Good stuff. And again, very tolerant of most of the things that the weather can throw at it. I have to say that wet snow and freezing rain are not kind to evergreen shrubs of any nature whatsoever. It just comes with the territory, unfortunately. And exhibit A of that is this plant, which is approximately 18 or so years old. This is growing along our driveway. And I regret to say that the wet snow that we had two weeks ago knocked it over. It's a goner. Uh, so it has to be removed. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. It's actually my own fault that that happened because it was planted on the corner of the shop. And so its canopy was not a complete uh, 360 degree thing. So the weight on the one side basically brought it down. So my fault. But anyway, lots of great manzanitas out there. Crocus, of course, any, uh, any bulb, uh, which is summer dormant, is by definition fully um, hardy and fully, uh, not fully hardy, but fully tolerant of drought in our climate. So there's so many crocuses, uh, I, I'm, you could not even begin to talk about the diversity in that genus, um, but clearly fully tolerant of summer drought here, as are things like daffodils, which uh, again, there are so many different daffodils. And of course, the bloom time varies depending on which one chooses, but we generally think of daffodils as being a sort of a February thing. Um, another native plant, which uh, does well, of course, uh, being uh, tolerant of summer drought because it's native to the area is Oregon grape. Um, so this is a typical form growing up to about five, six, seven feet tall and uh, about as wide with the yellow flowers in the spring, followed, of course, by those um, edible fruit later on. There are some smaller forms of Oregon grape out there. So the type form, of course, is widely available from uh, native plant nurseries. Uh, this is one called Apollo, uh, which is a form of aquifolium, apparently, but it's quite a bit smaller. So there are some dwarf forms like this out there. Um, I think there's a lot of room for selection of additional forms. Um, this is just a couple of things I took photos of. This is one up by Mill City, which I thought was a nice compact form and uh, heavy flowering, um, which, you know, just, they're just out there. And um, so a selection of some of these um, more attractive forms from the wild might not be such a bad thing. Here's another one, which is growing by, if you know, a Mosier out in the gorge. This is by the parking spot for the Mosier headlands or Mosier flat, again, Mosier plateau, that's it. <laughs> Mosier plateau hike. Um, and we just pulled up and here's this beautiful uh, form of um, Oregon grape growing there. I mean, it really deserves to be taken a few cuttings and brought into the trade. It's really a great ground cover. Um, the same can be said for some of our other native plants. Here's a Oso berry, which I usually think of at, after things like the native hazelnuts, um, um, it's really the, the first major broadleafed woody plant to come into bloom in the Willamette Valley. So this is usually starting to bloom around the middle of the end of February. And again, these will bloom more, this one was in full sun, so it's just blooming its heart out. They will grow in more shade. It's just that you see the, the amount of flowering that they do will diminish. So they have these clusters of white flowers followed by these fruit, which mature from a sort of an orange color uh, into the blue. And one will never get, they're, they're edible, um, but the birds will always get the fruit before, unless the plant is netted. So uh, this is a, a very popular plant with native birds as well. So it will seed itself around your garden as well, if you have any of these 
in the garden at all. Rosemary, of course, Mediterranean shrub, so by definition, uh, very tolerant of summer drought, uh, certainly of any drought that uh, we will get here. Um, I can't even begin to talk about all the different cultivars of uh, rosemary. Uh, this is one called ARP, um, but there are so many different forms out there, varying in size and also in flower color. And then, of course, there's trailing forms. Be aware that the trailing forms tend to be less hardy than the more upright growing forms, um, apparently because they originate in the milder western part of the Mediterranean, or so I've been told. Currants and gooseberries, okay, we already talked about one current, um, which is the chaparral current from Northern California, but Oregon is a center of diversity for currants and gooseberries, especially Southern Oregon. Um, so there are a lot of native species from which to choose. The most common, of course, is the large deciduous shrub flowering current Ribes sanguinium, which comes in uh, pink forms. This may be Pokey's pink. Uh, white forms, which I think this one might be one called Hanneman's white. And then, of course, everyone's favorite is those deep red forms. This is one down at Dancing Oaks Nursery, which originated the seedling that they call vampire. Uh, but there's also a couple of other red forms, uh, King Edward VII and uh, Elk River. Uh, all of which are deep red forms of this thing. And again, this is in bloom in uh, late March, April, and much beloved by uh, not only hummingbirds, but also uh, native pollinators. There are others as well, which are not native. This is from California. This is a, a fuchsia flowered gooseberry, uh, a spiny deciduous shrub. And again, it's summer deciduous. Um, so it drops all its foliage in the summertime and then leaves out again when it starts to rain. But it has these um, fuchsia type flowers, which dangle down from the uh, limbs in March, and so the hummingbirds uh, are, are comical to watch, just um, hovering vertically below these flowers as they feed on the nectar um, from those flowers. So um, a, uh, a very, very showy shrub while in bloom. We also have similar types of uh, fuchsia flowered um, gooseberries in uh, Western Oregon. This is gummy gooseberry, which is native to a wide area in uh, Southern Oregon, but also occurs in Polk County. And the form we grow is actually a Polk County form that was found out in the woods west of our home. So these are out there. Neil, let me interrupt with a couple of questions that have come in. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, what is the bloom time for Oregon grape? Uh, I usually think of it as being like early to mid-March or so. Okay. I think most uh, and of the photos have been taken then. March, let's say. Okay. And a second question, the uh, omleria, uh, is that also uh, what we would have known as uh, Indian plum? That is another name for it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Thank also you. berry. Or it's a, so omleria, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any others? Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So um, I don't know if those of you who are, this is one of Western Oregon, or at least this is one of Salem's, let's say that, um, better um, displays of native plants. And believe it or not, what you're looking at here is a field of camas. And that field is actually the parking lots for the Oregon State Fairgrounds, south of the fairgrounds themselves. That is a parking lot in the summertime. In May, it's this bloom of camas lily. So it's a, it's a camas prairie. Who knew? So yeah, again, it's a summer deciduous bulb. And um, so these occur naturally on our property. And so they come in a range of colors. This is a sort of a light blue form, but you see deep, deep blue forms as well. And there are other species or subspecies which um, are white. So uh, camas, of course, a native plant, fully, fully taller in the summer drought. If you've got lots and lots of space, um, ben, service berry is an option for you. Um, I'm not, I know that there are dwarfer forms of a service berry, which is also known as Saskatoon, which are grown specifically for their fruit, but the wild forms that you see around um, are just very large deciduous shrubs. So this is a, the, the plant in bloom. Again, these bloom in uh, May, uh, and then they're followed by fruit. The edibility of which varies by the clone. And that's just, I'll just be polite and say that because I've eaten these where they were probably better for cleaning your teeth than for actual edibility and others, which were very, very tasty. I mean, just right off the plant. So, you know, it depends on the individual clone. So getting on into early summer then, thyme, of course, there's so many different forms of thyme. I prefer the larger grown forms, thymus vulgaris being a little bit larger forms. There are others, um, a massive uh, honeybee and other pollinator attractors, these things, and they're just covered with 
um, covered with uh, uh, flowers when they're in bloom. And of course, there are also aromatic shrubs as well, which is kind of a nice characteristic when they're not in bloom. Um, rock roses, uh, again, we could, we could spend a, 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 an entire meeting talking about those. I'll sort of hurry through these. I'm keeping an eye on the time here, and I'm, I'm go going a little bit fast. This is our evaluation in Aurora. And again, uh, the uh, rock roses vary significantly in size and habit. What they all share is this tolerance of summer drought because they're true Mediterranean shrubs from the Mediterranean basin. Flowers may be white. Uh, they may be white with these spots in many cases at the base of each petal, uh, or they can be in many cases pink. And uh, again, uh, being from the Mediterranean basin, they are also very attractive to European honeybees. And then there's helimium, which vary. It's a, they've all now been lumped into cystus, uh, but helimium, strictly speaking, was a separate genus. And what distinguished it was the fact that it was uh, often had more silvery foliage as well as yellow flowers, which um, were uh, not uh, found in the genus Cystus, but they've all been kind of lumped together now. The most common ones are Cystus hybridus, so you'll, you'll find everywhere. It's about a four foot high by six foot across shrub. And then Cystus purpureus, which has these pink flowers or purpley flowers with the uh, dark petal, a uh, dark spot at the base of each petal. So Cystus purpureus, again, about a three to four foot tall plant and about six feet across. So we're talking big scale ground covers here. Um, and then another one you'll find which is much more diminutive and actually the longest or one of the longest flowering of the rock roses is Cystus pulverulentus sunset. So you can find these three very, very commonly. Uh, Halibium you might have to look a little bit harder for, but then you see the more silvery foliage on this particular one. This is Halibium lazyanthem, a select form called sandling, which has yellow flowers with a small reddish brown spot at the base of each petal. So a much more diminutive plant than some of the others. We found this to be a really good uh, ground cover in our trial. Um, this is Cystus obtusifolius, which is a rounded shrub to about three feet by four to five feet. Um, so it was just a, a, a more compact plant than some of the other um, Cystus turned out to be, uh, but good foliage quality, good hardiness, and plain white flowers. So it was a, it was a good plant. This is in our garden and it's a more upright growing form. So uh, a little bit more vase shaped, I guess you would say. This is Cystus aguilari, uh, a select form called maculatus, which again has those uh, spots at the base of each petal. So all of these are out there in the trade. You might have to look in a, a retail nursery, which is a little bit more esoteric selection to find them, but they can all be found. So this is what the flower on maculatus looks like up close. And then related to the rock roses are sun rose, uh, which is a different genus altogether, Helianthemum. Uh, the major species is Helianthemum numularium, and there are just a, a huge range of cultivars of this, which vary in color from white to yellow to the sort of pink to a, to a red or purple color. So this is just one called Belgravia rose. There are lots and lots of others out there, all completely tolerant of summer drought. Uh, Spanish lavender, um, again, um, uh, is a uh, as the name suggests, from the Mediterranean area, very unique in form um, and fragrant, of course, as lavender is, uh, super popular with bumblebees. And then wild lilacs, uh, Ceanothus. Um, as uh, many of you have probably encountered Ceanothus, this is pretty typical of what you get. They're not all this big, but many of them are, so it's something to be aware of. Um, we do have native Ceanothus in the Willamette Valley. This is uh, buckbrush, as it's called, Ceanothus cuneatus. This is along um, next near Adair Village on Highway 99W. Uh, on, on my way here, I passed by this. Um, so yeah, you'll find these. Uh, so a big spiny gray leaf, white flowered shrub, um, which again, um, grows fairly large. The other uh, large growing form, which is typically found is Ceanothus thursiflorus victoria, which is a big 10 foot by 10 foot evergreen shrub with these characteristic blue flowers. And so blue flowers are kind of prized in the landscape. And these are incredible pollina uh, pollinator magnets too. On the flip side, if you're looking for a ground cover, I mentioned Ceanothus gloriosus in that planting near the hospital early on. And this is what it looks like um, in bloom. So uh, a ground cover by comparison to Victoria, uh, but also proven to be very hardy and, and summer drought tolerant here in the Willamette Valley. And then there's everything in between. Uh, this is one called Tilden Park, reputed to grow about four feet tall and six to eight feet across. 
Um, this is a slightly larger form that we grow in our garden. This is actually at the Oregon Garden. This one is called Blue Jeans, one of the earliest to bloom. So it will generally be in bloom around the end of April or so. And then uh, Ceanothus impressus. This was uh, one in the Master Gardener Demo Garden in, uh, in Salem. Um, and so there's a, a few select forms of this, but essentially what you get is an enormous evergreen shrub with this uh, phenomenal display of blue flowers in late April and early May. And then for later bloom, um, you can choose one of the hybrid forms of Ceanothus. Ceanothus, this is Ceanothus delilianus. And these hybrid forms were hybridized between Western, um, Western North American forms of Ceanothus, most of which are evergreen shrubs, and the Eastern form of Ceanothus, which are deciduous. So you have these semi-evergreen hybrids. And this is one called Gloire de Versailles, which has blue flowers in June and July. So we're about at midsummer now. Um, if you're looking for a carefree uh, ground cover, this is a carpet broom. Uh, there's two major forms of this, which are distinguishable when they're not in bloom, um, but not when they are in bloom because there are almost variations on a theme here. But this is carpet broom Janista Lydia in a parking lot in Corvallis. And I had to show this picture just because of the topiary as well, which is matching the uh, carpet broom in color. Uh, so this is Janisti pilosa, another, they, go, they both go by the name of carpet broom, nitrogen fixing, drought tolerant, evergreen ground cover. Very tough stuff. Also one of the shortest blooming plants that you can plant. It literally will bloom for five days and then it's done. Uh, Flomus, we could go on again. Uh, we're, we're planning on adding some Flomus to an evaluation that we have, have up at Aurora. Um, so Jerusalem sage, um, the most commonly grown form is this one. Uh, this is a uh, Flomus fruticosa, which is also the most widely distributed of the Flomus uh, in and around the Mediterranean basin. So again, true Mediterranean plant, spikes of yellow flowers in uh, May and June, and then it can be cut back and it's actually a pretty good foliage plant. They make a good tall ground cover. Uh, there's also Flomus purpurea, which is, uh, again, sort of a variation on that. Rather than yellow flowers, it has these light pink or purple flowers. And then there's just a lot more to Flomus than meets the eye, I guess you could say. There's a lot of other species and cultivars out there which aren't typically found in cultivation here. This is one which um, is just just a just an incredible silver color, Flomus angustifolia, um, which we're going to be planting in, in, in uh, later on this year in our evaluation up in Aurora. Um, this is one of the more fun named plants. I don't know how it got the name Hairy Canary Clover, or if that's just supposed to be a joke and I'm not supposed to be repeating it. But anyway, uh, this is a diminutive a plant in the pea family, which has these, uh, it has this interesting silvery foliage and then equally interesting um, small flowers, which is sort of a purple white color. And this will, again, kind of like the hellebores, is not long lived. Um, well, the hellebores are long-lived. These are not necessarily long-lived, but they will seed themselves very politely next to the mother plant. So they kind of persist as um, seedling plants long-term. Again, lavender uh, in the July and August, we you know couldn't even begin to touch on those. I'm no expert on lavenders. Uh, this is just a form of lavender intermedia. So there's many, many, many forms, many, many species, and many cultivars out there. Bumblebees absolutely love lavender, by the way. If, if you've grown it, it the plants will just be covered in bumblebees. You can kind of see them, I think, in this uh, image here, um, all, all over this plant in July. And then oreganos, again, we're talking uh, Mediterranean herbs here. Um, or, or oreganum itself, the genus is, is a, an incredibly diverse genus. It's hard to believe that some of the plants that are, are included in that are actually uh, in the same genus. Well, here's one, oreganum levigatum, which we grew in our garden. And this is another oregano, um, one of these hop flowered oreganos, oreganum Kent Beauty. So it gives you an effect that nothing else does, right? This is a very diminutive shrub here, just sort of working its way amongst uh, the plants nearby. And then here's another form, um, Oregano rotundifolium, again, with those sort of hop type flowers and blue rounded leaves. So very unique plants in many, many respects, but very diminutive for those small parts of the garden. Roses, um, I showed you a couple of roses early on of our landscape, of course, native roses, um, are the toughest of the tough. One thing to be aware of roses though, is that they sucker. I found this out the hard way. Old roses sucker. So they will 
they will find themselves into places where you might not want them. And the better the soil, the more quickly they will spread. And that applies to our native roses as well. But they're undeniably beautiful and undeniably tough and free of you know, some of the diseases that we contend with with highly cultivated ones. Um, so where to begin? You know, there's, there's, there's no end to it. It's a, a one of the oldest cultivated plants. Here's a moss type rose that we grow in our garden. Pretty carefree, no summer water, which um, reduces its ability to spread, I guess you might say. Here's another very fragrant form that we grow, big, tough, uh, old rose called Ispahan. I mean, I'm just giving a couple of examples. The, the, the number of the plants that would fit the bill here is almost endless. And here's another one called Eddie's Jewel, which we bought years ago, which is actually not a suckering form. It's just this huge freestanding plant. That is not a climber, folks. That is actually a shrub form. Uh, and that's what you get. But be prepared to prune and wear armor when you're pruning. Um, of course, ocean spray. Uh, so June, July flowering plant. Uh, this is in Chipross Park, I believe. Uh, beautiful, one of, the, my, one of my favorite native, native plants. So tall, deciduous, uh, vase-shaped shrub, uh, eight to 10 feet tall and almost as wide. Good stuff. Um, sages, uh, we could, again, we, where to begin with salvias. Um, this is a European form, uh, evergreen form, salvia fisnalis with these blue flowers. There's also a purple form. So all of the sages for the most part are tough. Um, I do find that the um, salvias from you know, California, those areas actually perform a little bit better. They want to flower more if you give them some summer water. So in that respect, you know, I didn't include them on the list just because uh, in order to keep them blooming, they seem to want to have a little bit of summer water, even here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, lavender cottons as well. Here's another European shrub, kind of a curious thing in the aster family. So it has these uh, button flowers without the ray florets, uh, which a lot of aster family members have. But you get the silver foliage and you get the yellow flowers on this form. So this is um, the most commonly grown form, um, Santolina camisiparissus. Um, and that's what it kind of looks like. So it gives you an effect that nothing else really does. And when you're going to prune this thing in the dormant period, just get out the hedge trimmer and have at it. There is no good way to prune these things other than uh, shearing the back. But there are many other Santolinas out there. This is another one called Santolina rosemarinifolia, uh, which has greenish leaves and the uh, button yellow flowers, and another form yet, um, Santolina uh, pinata, this one called Edward Bowles with white flowers. So uh, yeah, just a unique plant in appearance uh, throughout the year. So later on, uh, getting into August, so uh, yuccas, of course, is probably yucca gloriosa. I find them hard to distinguish. Uh, the other thing I would uh, kind of like point out with yuccas um, kind of like the roses, which uh, want to sucker and will find themselves into places where you might not want them. Apparently, the root systems of yuccas are very aggressive and will grow deep. So if you've got a yucca and you want to get rid of it, apparently it's not that easy to do. So that's just hearsay. That's what I was told. I haven't had that problem. Uh, another one, sapphire. I mean, one thing you have to say is the yuccas give you something that nothing else does. So this is a select form. Uh, from Cistus Nursery, I believe, uh, uh, Yucca Rostrata, one called Sapphire Sky. So nothing else looks like that. Uh, and so in August and September, a uh, chase tree, this is Vitex agnus castus, a uh, European shrub um, of Mediterranean origin. And again, it's late blooming. It has these spikes of blue flowers and just uh, you'll hear this plant before you see it. It is uh, so alive with pollinators uh, at that time of the year. So very, very popular plant with pollinators. Also in bloom at the same time of the year, they might make good companions. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the California fuchsias um, used to be in the genus Zoshneria, now they're Epilobium. Um, so they have these tubular red, or in some cases pink, or in some cases white flowers, but the type form is this red type of tube flowers. And again, you can imagine uh, hummingbirds would absolutely adore these things, and they do. They are native to Southern Oregon. This is actually in the middle of the Chetco River down near Brookings growing on a rock. Um, and so uh, they don't need an awful lot. So they are grown kind of as a perennial. It's actually a woody shrub, uh, but they can be cut back to ground level in early spring and then they'll grow back. And then a lot of them have this silvery foliage with those red flowers. They sucker very politely to form a nice little colony. 
Um, and again, not, else, uh, not much else will give you this effect in the garden late in the summer and into the fall. Here's a planting of the Oregon garden in their parking lot with manzanita, uh, with that hairy canary clover, and with rosemary and lavender. So kind of a mixed planting with this is the color spot late in the summer. Um, autumn f uh, blooming uh, bulbs as well. Uh, so this is autumn daffodil, Sternbergia, which is kind of unusual, not that well known. But um, what's nice about it is it comes into bloom in September and October. Uh, and they get these yellow crocusy like flowers in uh, at that time of the year. Um, also shrubby, uh, sh shrubby hare's ear. Um, this is in competition with the hairy canary clover for most unusual name. Uh, but this is in the carrot family. And it's a evergreen shrub, which produces these um, uh, clusters of um, yellow flowers in late August and September. So it is Mediterranean in origin, very tolerant of drought, um, and also a good pollinator plant uh, at that time of the year. And oddly enough, is very attractive to bald-faced hornets. I kid you not, they specifically will go after the flowers on this particular plant. And then later on in uh, the fall uh, and into October, coyote brush. This is, again, uh, you'll find this in bloom on the coast in Oregon, uh, mostly as a rounded shrub. And evidently, it's creeping into the Willamette Valley as well. But it's better known um, in California, northern California, as a ground cover. So this is a form. I, th I think she took this picture in California. I'm not sure which cultivar it is. But again, it's in the aster family. It's got the... Um, it's got the, uh, the flowers without the ray floret. So um, you get the disc flowers without the corresponding ray flowers as you might in an aster. But the interesting thing about the flowers is that they're fragrant uh, and they come on in September and they smell kind of like a mix between hay and honey is the way somebody described it. So it's kind of a warm, you know, nice smell, not, not a, a rose type scent, but uh, nevertheless, they're fragrant. Um, so it's a broad spreading evergreen shrub for ground cover. So here's an example of it. This is one called Twin Peaks, which is being used as a ground cover. A little bit tender, I have to say. Um, but if you can get it to go, it certainly would be uh, hardy in the last three winters around here. Uh, it's really cold winters that tend to damage plants like this. And then, of course, strawberry tree. It's named strawberry tree for a reason because they're huge. This is an old growth form up in Aurora, the North Willamette Research and Extension Center. Uh, has this plant. It was planted in 1969, and it's just huge. But they don't all have to be that way. There are dwarf forms out there, and this is a nice one in Bush Park in Salem, which I took a photo of. Um, and it's both in flower and in fruit at the same time, the fruit being the products of the flowers from the previous October and November when, uh, when the plant was in bloom. So um, yeah, they produce these colorful fruit. They're called strawberry tree for a reason. These are apparently uh, edible, uh, although I have not tried. Uh, but as with the uh, Saskatoon berries or service berries, apparently they vary in edibility. So I'm just not willing to try yet. But there are other uh, forms out there um, which are dwarf. This is one called Elfin King. And there's another one we grow called Oktoberfest as well, okay? Uh, and so lastly, I think this is the last slide and I apologize if I've gone a little long here. Um, this is another one of those shrubs which um, is just incredibly long blooming. This is a, a form of Grevillea. Grevillea are Australian shrubs uh, for the most part. Um, most of them are not hardy. We had a Grevillea trial and you saw the fate of the Grevillea lanigera I showed earlier. Uh, most of them would not be used in landscapes, only as container specimens with protection in the winter. But this one has proven to be pretty uh, tolerant of, of pretty much anything the winter can throw at it here. And this is called Grevillea victoriae, and it's a select form called Marshall seedling. And this produces these clusters of reddish flowers starting in December, and it will literally continue until late March or April. So it's just got this incredibly long period of bloom. And these flowers are actually not even open yet and they're already showy. These are the open flowers, which are much beloved by bumblebees, by hummingbirds, and when it gets warm enough for other, other pollinators as well. So a very unusual plant for the landscape um, in the Willamette Valley. And lastly, I'll just finish up with a, uh, a before and after photo of a, a plant landscape in Monmouth, uh, which we did a few years ago. 
oops, it was this empty area with all this blue, it was actually bluegrass, which was growing in here. And the community and development director um, was fond of fixing up these forlorn areas of town. So we planted that in 2012 and that was the end result. No irrigation in this planting either, by the way. So that is what one can do without too much in the way of work, mostly just with uh, plant selection and soil preparation. So on that note, I will stop. I guess I can stop screen sharing. Is that the thing to do, uh, Alan? Probably.